So, imagine it's 15 years from now and we're at almost 2030. There are very nearly 100 billion devices connected to the internet. When the Dutch startup Spark put pregnancy centers on cows in 2008, everyone thought it was pretty cool. But now, almost three decades into the 21st century, as we look over a field of newborn lambs, knowing that each and every one was chipped at birth, like every other farmed animal in the UK, this seems old. Their owner pulls out his phone, since he's never really liked the contact lenses, screens, and doesn't like those funny glasses. And he shows you a map displaying from above what you see in front of you. As he clicks on one of the dots representing the use, it flashes briefly to show the location of her children, and then the screen changes to show a report on her health, medical treatments received, and so on. This is precision agriculture for livestock. Each gets exactly and only the treatment it needs, kind of topical in the uh, antibiotics conversation that's going on at the moment. And welfare is not, was not completely assured, then very strictly monitored and open for anyone to inspect. And in this volume, it costs pennies. Naturally, after the government regulation on transparent food supply chains in 2016, all this data is available in near real time on data.gov.uk <coughs> since 2019. And now that the DNA fingerprinter is available to anyone who wants it as a £30 unit, supply chain fraud, like Horsegate, hasn't been a significant issue for almost a decade, even in fish. Although paternity <coughs> suits are going through the roof. <laughs> As you walk across the field, he tells you about the apple trees he planted. He was originally going to put in cheap replacement field shelters, but when the local water authority started paying landowners to plant trees to reduce runoff and protect soils, as recommended long before the first flood, the first long flood of 1314, it became a no-brainer. He now has over 300 trees across his land, acting as windbreaks too, which is a bonus during the now stormier winters. In the neighbour's field, a robot about the size of a shoebox is moving slowly but inexorably between the rows of salad. Suddenly it darts out a spike skewering a slug. James made it himself from plans he downloaded off the internet. It's powered by biogas and collects slugs and other pests in a container. His yields have gone up 6% since he started using it, so he's thinking about building the Cropmaster version next winter, which has a soil analyzer and jets which deliver a tailored blend of nutrients to the plant roots when the weather forecast tells it it won't be washed away. Precision agriculture like this has been going on for decades, but mainly in large, expensive machinery. It was the open source maker movement who created the plans for swarms of affordable autonomous units, and the modern farmers who used them to support their agroecological methods. And now, with artificial intelligence expected that to reach that of an adult human within the next decade, He's looking forward to the day when his drones can do more of his work for him. He wants to fine tune his companion planting experiments and find time to teach others how to replicate his work out in the countryside, not just here in the city. When the most market ready fruits and leaves have been harvested, he snaps a photo and types into the food trade app what, exact, what and how much they crop that day. All the regular orders are deducted immediately, leaving him with a small surplus which he places on the market. 20 minutes later, it's sold by auction to a cafe a few hundred metres from one of his regular stockists. When self-driving vehicles were declared road legal in the UK in 2013, James's dad had invested in Uber and Halo, hedging his bets on which would capture the home delivery market. Uber won out thanks to its relationship with Google, and when they launched the global courier section of the business, spanning from 40-ton lorries to the stair-climbing neighbourhood units about the size of a squat wardrobe, they won pretty much every contract going. They even had a new class of sail-powered cargo ship, developed after they acquired B9 shipping in 2018. Their routing and fuel efficiency, coupled with, coupled with lower maintenance costs and their tiny labour bill, allowed them not to come in just cheaper, but safer, and vastly more environmentally friendly. It's no coincidence that fatal and non-fatal lung diseases have fallen almost 30% since they started, even up to 50% for children in some European cities. Uber licensed the technology to the once dominant UK supermarkets, but they, only did, but they only did distribution. It was Amazon who actively worked to start collections too. Amazon's main advantage was that it was self-awareness and its market positioning. It never pretended to be a food company. It knew that it wanted to be the most efficient peer-to-peer -peer retailer and logistics company the world had ever seen. In 2019, two years after the purchase of Food Trade, 
It relaunched. <laughs> it relaunched Amazon Plex, this time as a service which would pick up from producers, combine it with international produce, staples, branded products, and household items at tens of thousands of its micro aggregation and distribution sites and do same or next day delivery. Customers flocked to it. It never had to overcome the long public mistrust of supermarkets. It supported and empowered local independent businesses. It delivered fresher food with less packaging. And switching was easy because we were all doing online ordering anyway. James and his friends at Zero Carbon Food, growing hydroponically in the once disused tunnels beneath him, sell their produce via farm drop. This was before we switched, sorry. Uh, a simple and effective uh, service where rather than being powered by Amazon, it's managed by someone nearby. Since everyone is part of the buying group, the discounts on bulk save members money, generate more local employment opportunities, and people like meeting and working with their neighbours. Looking back, it was the small things that people didn't really notice happening which started the snowball rolling. The progressive beer duty in 2002, which prompted all those microbreweries and local culture. Repealing the market charter and changing planning law to stamp out the playgrounds for supermarkets, bribery of local authorities, led to market and high street renaissance. The mayor of Bristol's legal challenge to EU public sector procurement rules so he could match the city of Malmo on their target of 100% organic in all public meals by 2020. Boris might like do the same. Uh, and when health things, not that George is doing that either, actually, there's some fiction, but Boris should. Uh, and, uh, and when health insurers added obesity multipliers to policies, it became obvious that there was no such thing as cheap food. Food became more and more visible, more valued and appreciated as a product in a class of its own, and crucially, something that you could make a living in. Something which could regenerate ecosystems and reverse greenhouse gas emissions, slash healthcare costs, improve performance in schools and behaviour across in prisons, even across whole cities enrich culture and create conviviality, all the while nurturing and supporting healthy, skilled livelihoods in resilient and vibrant regional economies across the country. So, what's the problem, right? <laughs> Sustainable, fair, resilient supply chains or supply webs, really, are just a matter of time. <laughs> Alas, not. The challenge is not how to have a sustainable supply system, it's how to transition to one. And that's why this conference is quite exciting, because that's, this is where we're working out what those policies are and what those leverage points are that create the simple, crunchy ideas that change the game. So about food trade, um, there's what Christopher said, basically. <laughs> if, if you were listening to what Christopher said, we do that. Uh, so uh, we started Food Trade to democratise data, which speeds up this, this revolution, this transition. If you look at Tesco's and Unilever and Sainsbury's and the big companies that depend upon market and supply chain data to maintain and grow their position, I want to know what would happen if we took that same kind of data and made it available to any food business to literally the 99% of SMEs in the industry across Europe who are working on low margins and who struggle to access the information, partners, and resources that they need? What if the open data revolution could create a food system which substitutes economies of scale with network efficiencies? With efficient subsidiary networks of companies trading locally, responsibly, and intelligently? I looked around and there were lots, as is it Matt? Simon, sorry, um, was saying there are lots of people doing stuff in this space and all of us being kind of protective about data and not sharing it. And lots of reinvention of the wheel going on and cannibalization of, of small, insufficiently big markets. And uh, so it struck me that there was something else needed that was open and collaborative that kind of sat behind all of these, all of these data repositories, data storages that could just be available for anyone to put information in and take information out, kind of like Wikipedia or something. And so that's what Food Trade does. It's an open and collaborative service which maps supply and maps demand, allowing anyone to post their shopping list or just their product list. We're a virtual marketplace which makes the real-time trading just about as easy as tweeting. Uh, we organise real world events as well. Um, in the last one, we had 16 people turn up to a tour, which were us actually, so 14 people turn up to it. We had 12 trade connections made between 14 people. 
Like, it's that easy. If you get people in a room, if you just reduce the barriers to participation and collaboration, people want this to happen. It's just helping them do it. And we do market analytics to highlight the cost savings or market growing opportunities to find those people that you could be working with, could be selling to. And we make the data open to anyone to use. And because it's just about data and because it's all online, it scales from farm to fork and smallholder to supermarket. Urban to rural and even country to country. We've got people in Costa Rica using this to find guavas, even though you can't find stuff in Swansea. I'm sorry about that. It kind of works wherever people want it to work and wherever people share and put in information. Um, we're not transactional. Christopher was making the point about friction and eliminating different types of friction whilst preserving other types of friction. People say to us quite a lot, why don't you just get involved and why don't you take a cut of all sales? Because if we did that, we would, we would reduce the opportunities for people to meet each other. And we would also get cut out of the transaction as soon as the second one had happened. We want there to be a little bit of stickiness. We want people to have build up a personal relationship between each other. We, we're a dating site. We're not a, a, a dogging site. We're, we're, we're a place where people meet each other and build fruitful and productive relationships. Uh, sorry. Uh, we started as, uh, as mainly B2B uh, and as a business to business service saying, you know, share your data, collaborate, yeah, you save the world. And people went, yeah, I'm going to take from my supply chain. Why would you want to know my supply chain? To share it with other businesses? No, thanks. Not very much, no. And so, shit, okay, people are you know, not as cool as we thought they were. And so we opened it up to customers and brought in something for customers to do so that customers could act as a bit of a lever on businesses. And so now there's, there's much more consumer visibility of the whole thing. And just having and being able to say, hey, why don't you showcase your stockets and suppliers to your customers and they can vouch for your food? Now the conversation changes entirely because that's a narrative that they can hook into and understand. It's, it's amazing how much framing matters. Uh, so we've over 1,300 businesses around the world, not again in Swansea, uh, and we're growing quite fast at last. Um, because, like Wikipedia and Google, we are providing the tools and information that our members need to do more of what they want to do. So, why do we do it like this? Because if we want to have these things, if we, if we want to generate those outcomes in a world that is seeing these things going on, we need to have smaller units, plentiful, diverse, variety, resilience, and we need to have a lot more farmers. Sorry, I'm totally in the way. Uh, now, if you've got a lot more farmers and diverse units, you then have a mesh network, which then has a secondary set of problems, which is how the hell do you get this mesh network collaborating, communicating effectively with each other? And the barriers to sustainable purchasing among small businesses typically are, top of the list, only at 52%, mind you, is price which means that for the other 40%, you're already pushing against an open door on this one. They're happy to pay a little bit more for something that's worth it. The next one, or the next few, in fact, are uh, market information issues. <laughs> Finding suppliers and stockists, knowing what's available, making sure that you've got either enough suppliers or enough people working with those suppliers to guarantee you a consistent supply. Multiple deliveries, it's a hassle because you've got all sorts of chain of custody checks to do, and then trust. So we're working on these ones, and this one, and trust. By, by giving people a um, profile in which they can have that social credibility, in which they can say, look, these, this is our company. We're kind of open about what we do. This is who we're working with. You can check us out. This is the transactions we're making. Come and find out more about us. Um, and, but... This is not enough. Alternative agri-food networks working with digital technology are subject to this graph about the laws of disruption. The technology allows us to do cool stuff and we try to bring users in as fast as possible and then eventually we kind of hope to help that our business model works out eventually. And then the, the policy uh, kind of supports it all and comes in and regulates for failures. However, this graph also shows us what's actually holding us back. 
above a certain threshold, this gap between technology and politics is known as law breaking. <laughs> it's a failure of policy. Ask Farm Job about the chain of custody issues they face and the issues that are not faced by other countries in Europe. There comes a point at which it, you, you are so urged to do something beyond what is currently limited, um, constrained by the law. And the gap between a social ado adoption of um, technology, a social adoption of technology, and business, so this bit, is a failure of economics to measure value. Indeed, many suggest that the absence of economic growth that we're currently seeing across the Eurozone, across the world, isn't due to inactivity. Data is being generated and social value is being generated in colossal quantities. But it's because we no longer measure the thing that has value. You may have heard of true cost accounting within the field of agriculture. This is true benefit accounting. We just aren't measuring the stuff that we're actually doing that's got real value these days, and so we aren't being effectively rewarded for it and accounting for it. If we are to flourish, we have to change the rules of the game. Food and agriculture is currently a market failure. Any system which so depletes the environment, public health, and leads to so much market concentration simply cannot be said to be serving us correctly. No one wants to be on a race to the bottom on price. We know that it should be a race to the top on quality. No one wants to pollute the planet, but until everyone values it, there's a first mover disadvantage in spending money to protect something which your competitors are treating as free. Food and agriculture is a market failure because it makes our solutions look like problems. We have too much food. It's just not in the right place. We have an abundance of knowledge. It's just not appropriately distributed. And we know what to do, but there's no money to do it. Food and agriculture is currently a market failure and we are subsidizing its worst players. And because it's a market failure, it's incredibly hard to solve because there's no money to make the problems go away. The people working in this area face the challenge of trying to work within two socioeconomic paradigms at the same time. The crude 20th century model with private gains and the 21st century model with, with public benefits. They're working with a huge range of stakeholders with wildly contrasting values and urging them to adopt what we've been led to believe are risky behaviours to ensure long-term collective good. If you have the means, please support these people. But changing the whole food system could be easy if we set the right goals. And I'm kind of preempting some of the conversation tomorrow because I figured I had a platform right. <laughs> If we set the appropriate goals and the infrastructure and then just get out of the way. Who, who knows Danella Meadows and systems change? Okay, good. Not that many of you, which means I'm not going to be too boring. In fact, no, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to talk about it too much because I've been waffling on and on. Go and find out about it. It's brilliant. Um, essentially, here is the problem. The further up this lever you can get, the easier it becomes to change the problem. But it's also harder to get up the lever. So we have a tendency at conferences and situations like this to kind of mess around and think about you know, various different local targets and small different taxes and legislation that we could do at a local level. And it doesn't really do that much. We sometimes think about reinforcing positive feedback loops and negative feedback loops and trying to shift customer behavior away from different people. And again, it's kind of cool, it's a lot better, but mm, not that much. We can change the system structure and self-organization, like farm shop is and like we're trying to do, and empowering people to help themselves to create the different model. That does more. We can change the rules around the system. That does more. Like, what is the point of the food system? What are the outcomes? What are you not allowed to do? You're not allowed to pollute. You're not allowed to spray pesticides wantonly. You're not allowed to kill bees. Um, and then you can change the fundamental goals of the system and the fundamental purpose that we all subscribe to as being part of the system. And for me, that's the fundamental goal of the food system. If we're not really working for that, and if we're not thinking about policies that make that happen, we're kind of neglecting our responsibility as people in this room who are solving this problem. Because I, for one, don't want to be here talking about alternative agri-food networks. I want to be talking about future-proof, sustainable agri-food networks. Thank you.